The scripture today comes from Philippines 2, 1 through 13. If then there is any in encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfishness, ambition, or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself. Taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out with your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. I heard somebody say one time that the biggest influencer of what we believe is not actually what we read in Scripture. It's not actually what we hear in sermons. It's not even what we hear in Sunday school. The biggest influencer of what we really believe are hymns and songs that we sing. And in my experience, I would say that's actually probably true. And I think it's true because music doesn't just engage our intellectual brain, it also engages this soul piece, something way down deep inside of us. I mean, it's the reason that all of us know somebody or, or know of stories about a person with dementia or Alzheimer's that can't even form words anymore, but yet you start singing Amazing Grace and all of a sudden, there they are. Hymns and songs are powerful things, which is why it's not surprising to me that when the Apostle Paul wants to communicate something incredibly central about who, who Jesus is, he actually uses a hymn. It may not have been formatted this way, I don't know how it was on the screen, but there is this section in our scripture, the part where it starts about Jesus being uh, equal to God and emptying himself and all of that stuff. That's actually written in poetic verse, and really was most likely a hymn of the early church. And I don't think it's a surprise that this section of Scripture is so moving and powerful for a lot of people. I mean, that's the power of a hymn. I do find this particular description of Jesus and Paul's challenge to be like Jesus incredibly ex inspiring and moving. I mean, to think that it would even be possible to have the same mind as Christ. I mean, that, that is an amazing thing to think about. The Scripture is inspiring, but it is also very challenging. This call to humility, that is one that does not make sense for a lot of people. And quite frankly, that road of humility, that is a very hard road to walk sometimes. It's a necessary one, but a difficult one. This week, however, this scripture has also been very challenging for me for a slightly different reason as well. See, the core, a core part of what Paul is saying here is that we need to be of one mind as followers of Jesus. He's calling us to unity. And I think that unity is a core calling of the church. It's a core practice of the church. And it's something that shows up all over scripture. A couple that have really been on my heart recently are, uh, for example, from Galatians. The Apostle Paul describes something that he calls the fruit of the Spirit. Basically, these are visible markers of the Holy Spirit at work in someone's life. And the things he names are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, which are probably familiar to a lot of us. Even the term fruit of the Spirit may be familiar. 
But the thing that I find interesting is that, that many of us may have actually forgotten that right before that, Paul talks about another list called the works of the flesh. It's the opposite of the fruit of the Spirit. And in that list, what has caught my attention recently is that right there in the middle, he names quarrels, dissensions, and factions. Basically, if, if the fruit of the Spirit includes unity, the, the lack of the Spirit brings disunity. In the Gospel of John, Jesus spells out the importance of unity even more clearly. In John 17, Jesus prays for His disciples. And amazingly, Jesus prays for those who will become His disciples in the future, which means this prayer is Jesus praying for us, which is a humbling thing in and of itself. But right in the middle of that prayer, Jesus says this, I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me in, will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. They may all be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus is saying. First of all, that to be in unity in the church is to do the same thing that Jesus is doing with God. But also, being unified in the church is so important because it is the reason that anybody has any reason to pay any attention to us. If we are divided like the rest of the world around us, why, why would anybody believe anything else we have to say? Unity is a big, big deal for the church. Now, here's the thing. I'm all on board for this biblical vision of unity. The problem is that for me this week, unity seems to be in kind of short supply. In the last week or so, there are three big things that have sort of come into my awareness that have caused me to think pretty deeply about unity or to, to think about the disunity in this world. One of which that we're probably all aware of to some degree is this whole national conversation we're having about people in the NFL taking a knee in order to protest police brutality and racial injustice. Now what's really struck me is not necessarily the protest itself, but rather the conversation that has unfolded afterwards. And I've watched, particularly on social media, as people have just dug their heels in and tried to argue their point and have refused to listen to each other. The other thing that's been on my mind this week are some conversations that I had last weekend at our district leadership retreat. And I'm not going to go into all of it, but the short of it is that there are parts of our denomination that <clears throat> seem to be mo moving towards a church split. That seems to be picking up more and more steam. Or at the very least, there are certain groups of people who really don't want to hang around with or be associated with other groups of people. The big one for me, however, was getting an email from a pastor friend of mine that... <laughs> that basically said, look, we're headed for another war. And this time it's probably going to involve a nuclear weapon. And so as pastors, we ought to figure out how we're going to respond when that happens. This is what I've been thinking this week as I have been reading this scripture on unity. I've been sitting with these two things. On one hand, holding this clear biblical, biblical call to unity. On the other hand, been holding all of these giant examples of division and disunity. And I'll be honest, for most of the week, I had no clue what I was going to say today. But then I went back and simply kept reading the Scripture. I kept reading the Scripture over and over again, and finally God gave me a question to ask that really pointed me in the right direction. and was given some insight. I kept reading this text and I kept seeing that, well, yes, clearly God is calling us to unity. But then the question came, well, how exactly does that work? Well, in this scripture, what is the pathway to unity? How is it that unity is achieved through this scripture? Well, for starters, unity for Paul here, is achieved first and foremost by being of the same mind. But not just any mind. It's not about agreeing with each other. 
It's, all, it's about all of us setting our, our own minds aside and having the mind of Christ. We find unity first in attempting to do what Christ did and to be in this world in the way that Christ was in this world. Which then leads to the second question, well, what did Christ do? And in this scripture, I see three big things that Paul describes. The first is that Jesus humbled himself. At the beginning of that hymn section of our scripture, it says that even though he was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. Basically, Paul is saying that Jesus is fully God and could have used that status and power to do anything he wanted, to get anything he wanted for himself, to exploit it for whatever personal gain he could. But instead, Jesus gave it all up and humbled himself and put his own interests aside for the sake of others. In the same way, Paul tells us just before that that we should do the same thing. We should do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. The other thing that Jesus does in this scripture is that he makes himself vulnerable. It says that Jesus humbled himself and made himself obedient, which is a form of vulnerability, even to the point of death. Even death on a cross, which is incredibly humiliating, was an incredibly humiliating way to die. Jesus, who has all of the power of God, chooses to place himself at the mercy of human beings even to the point of allowing himself to be killed in a particularly humiliating way. And we too are to have that mind. To do the same thing that Jesus did. The third thing I see in here is that Jesus entered into a relationship with humanity. It says that Jesus, even though he was equal with God, came into this world as a human being. And not even a powerful human being. A slave, the lowest of the low. Jesus came into this world to be like us. To be with us. Which is really the only way that humanity can have a genuine relationship with God. This scripture tells us that Jesus came into the world with humility and vulnerability and relationship with humanity. And I think that it's when we take on those same things, that same mindset, when we do what Jesus did, That is when unity can happen. Now, as I reflected on this in light of all the division that seems to be floating around, it did eventually strike me that that this path towards humility, or towards unity, is really different than what I see in the world around us. It's the complete opposite. If the path towards unity runs through humility, The path towards division fundamentally runs through arrogance. If the path towards unity is about putting others before yourself, the path towards division is about self-centeredness and insisting on your own way above everybody else's. If the path towards unity involves vulnerability, the path towards division involves shows of force and setting up boundaries to be defended. If the path towards unity involves being in genuine mutual relationship with other people, then the path towards division is built on defining us versus them, who's in and who's out. The more I've sat with this this week, the more I've been able to see that unity and division, they're the end result of a whole bunch of other stuff. Two completely different ways of being in this world. Living with humility and vulnerability and relationship ultimately is what produces the fruit of unity. Whereas living with, the arrogant, with arrogance and self-centeredness and defensiveness and tribalism, that is what will ultimately produce the fruit of division. Now perhaps this shouldn't be particularly surprising that the world is full of division because the world doesn't necessarily have a commitment to following Jesus, to having the same mind of Christ. But the church, that's a different story. I think division in the church, whether it's now or throughout the generations, I think the reason that when division shows up in the church that it's so painful, at least to me, is that 
Well, that it's evidence that the Spirit is lacking. It's evidence that we're not living fully in the mind of Christ. I do think that one of the greatest sins of the church is that we too often have taken up the practices of division that we see in this world. Instead of emulating the world, we should be showing the world a different way. A way that goes through humility, vulnerability, and relationship. Now after sitting with this text all week, I I am beginning to get some sort of sense of what this might mean to work towards unity through humility. But I will also say that, well, I may be understanding it a little bit more clearly. There's a whole lot of areas where I don't really have a clue. I think I have a pretty good handle on what it means to work for unity through the path of humility on, on a congregational level. I think I even have an idea of what that might mean for us and, let's say, progressive missionary Baptists as we build a relationship with each other. I even have a pretty good idea of what I think that can look like in our district here with the churches in our geographical area. But I'll be honest, I'm not really sure that I have an idea of what it looks like beyond that. I'm not sure of what unity through humility looks like for our denomination or for the churches of the world in general interdenominationally. And I've got even less of an idea of what working for unity through humility means for the political or social landscape. That's beyond me at this point. I don't really feel like I know what it means to work for unity through the path of humility in many of these important areas, but but just because I can't see it doesn't mean I don't have hope. Even though I can't see the path forward, I still have hope because I know that Jesus can see the way forward. I have hope because the power and the Spirit of Jesus is still at work throughout this entire world, even if I'm not aware of it. I have hope because even though it feels like the world may be more and more divided, at the end of the day, I know that it is the love of God for all people that unites everybody, whether we realize it or not. Today we are celebrating something special. Today we're celebrating World Communion Sunday. World Communion Sunday is a celebration of what is and what is to come. On one hand, we join together today and we celebrate communion. Our common following of Jesus with people from every denomination, every place around the globe. It's a celebration of the community that already exists. But World Communion Sunday also looks forward to the unity that we strive for in the future. We also recognize the brokenness and the division that is all too common. And today, we look towards the healing and the hope of moving past it. Today, as we eat the bread and drink from the cup as reminders of Jesus, we do so with the hope and the promise that all will be made one. The service of communion today reminds us of the bonds that we have with each other. But it also calls us to walk the path of humility that will ultimately lead us to unity.